What is up, Empire Builders? Welcome to another Weekend Reads. This is episode four, and man, oh man, was it a juicy week. We did six emails, uh, audio, a couple audios, and then the, the regular five days. So if you aren't already subscribed, it's simple. Just head to empirealerts.substack.com, and that's where we host it, and go ahead and put in your email address, and it just shows up to your inbox every day. No fluff, no bullshit, just straight macro economy every single day. So last week was a really busy week, a lot going on, and there's even some additional stuff we need to catch up on that's happened over the last day or so. On top of that, last week was the best week we've ever had with the emails, consistently getting the highest open rates, the highest read rates. So thank you very much. Whatever you guys are doing has been amazing. Sharing it, just reading it. I mean, this is insanely valuable information, and it's not just information. I think and I feel that it is arranged in a way that will best benefit you and all these pieces, it would take you so much time to go and read them and research them and figure out what it actually means and the way that we're consistently talking about things over and over and over again and the way we structure it, well, I hope that it is insanely valuable for you, all right? So we started off Monday catching up on that last weekend there was that Jackson Hole meeting and it was a central banking summit and so Monday central banks bailing on the United States dollar Mark Carney the uh, governor of the Bank of England was by far the most important speech and he talked about the fact that over the last 10 years the United States dollar has been too strong inflation is too low it's below their mandated target of two percent um, and they're not making, essentially, they're not making enough money off interest rates either. Interest rates are too low as well. And he talked about a digital currency replacing it. So they are talking, they are all but saying we're going to overthrow the United States dollar as the global reserve currency. And it's either going to be the SDR, which has been around for a long time, which is a currency basket of five different currencies, or it's going to be the Libra, which is the Facebook project, it's the stable coin that will have a basket of currencies behind it, or even um, the uh, Chinese crypto that they're testing right now, or even the Chinese Yuan. So that was Monday. I've covered this already in another video, and then obviously we've got this this email, and I've, I've re-talked about this many times now this week because it's so important, absolutely important. Um, so yeah, PBOC has um, started to test out its digital currency. And if you remember, the BIS had clearly said earlier this year, we're going to support central banks in their efforts to create digital currencies. Well, now, I guess the big question is, is this why Trump is, is fighting the Fed so much? Because he already knew. There was, there, was, there was no choice. They were going to overthrow it anyways. Right? And the reason why might have changed, like how or why they were going to overthrow it, that might have changed. But it looks like they've been working on this and this is just the next step of the plan. Because if you go all the way back through, I mean, there's papers talking about how they could go into negative interest rates from 2004, 2013, 2017. I'm working on a really big report right now talking about essentially the birth of digital currencies. But there's a lot of effort and time that's gone into this. This isn't just that IMF blog post from November was the start of this whole conversation about a dual currency. They've been planning this for a long time. So, I don't know, in my brain, I automatically just think, well, that that might have something to do with this rift going on between Jerome Powell and the Fed and the current White House administration, right? Whereas a lot of other people, because they have bias or maybe they just don't like Trump, would just say, oh no, it's just Trump being a fill in the blank, right? You see the difference? We're trying to look at uh, data and discern what's going on, right? And, and it helps to read The Art of the Deal. It really does, whether you like them or not. The Art of the Deal is an amazing book. I've listened to it, I don't know, probably half a dozen times by now. So the, the plays and the things that he's doing with the trade war and the things that he's doing with the Fed and how he kind of plays it is, in, is very much indicative of what's in The Art of the Deal and very much Donald Trump. Like that's, he's not making that up. He hasn't changed. That's how he does things. Okay, Tuesday, did the Fed cause the yield curve? I've talked about this a little bit too, but essentially here's what's going on. We had uh, QT, which is quantitative tightening, aka getting rid of money supply, stop in the middle of this year. Now QE3 ended 
where was that? 2015. They haven't been printing money since 2015, supposedly. But they just made a purchase of $8 billion of mostly seven and 10 year treasuries, which is what everything is pinned up against. Most uh, like uh, interest rates and mortgage rates and a lot of other vehicles are pinned to the 10 year treasury note. And they just spent $8 billion buying up treasury bonds. So did we just start QE4 and nobody said anything yet? That's what this piece is exploring. And then also we talk about uh, at the end, the Kansas City Fed President Esther George literally said on the 22nd, the bloated Fed balance sheets could be to blame for the yield curve. When actually I would say that's not it. It's simply the fact that when you print money and dilute things down and then you burn money and, and uh, shrink the money supply, when you play these games, you create a shrinkage and expansion. A contrast and um, an expansion, right? And so during that, you create these these times of uh, bad int- uh, bad yield rates, okay? Or even inversion rates, uh, yield curve inversions, okay? So look at this. They coincide almost perfectly with the 30 year. This is our 20 year here. Look at this. Every, you know, most of the big dips coincide with a quantitative easing and a quantitative tightening schedule. So there's a correlation between printing money and how well treasury notes do. That I don't know. Call me crazy, but that just makes logical sense. So this uh, this was probably I think our most read email yet. Okay, Wednesday, jumping jumping along into it. Negative interest rates won't save us. Um, so this piece covers this ridiculous notion that negative interest rates will somehow help. So here's the timeline. Here's how funny the Fed is. And you got to really watch. You got to really look because otherwise you just watch this stuff and you'll be like, oh, well, this must be true. Okay, so back in February, San Francisco Fed published an economic letter titled, How Much Could Negative Interest Rates Have Helped the Recovery? Here's their proposed trajectory for how much better it could have gotten versus this blue line is the actual in terms of the 2009 financial crisis. This is what they proposed, okay? And that came out four days after the European Central Bank, or ECB, said that essentially negative interest rates would level inequality and all but remove an inequality. So those two, those two dates, the launching of those two data points and, and that information was absolutely strategic. And, and that's smart, you know, like brands and businesses do this. So why wouldn't bankers do this, right? Like when you're doing a product launch, you stack seven day email sequence, don't you? And you talk about all the features and benefits of your product. And then you talk about how the shopping cart's gonna close towards the end because you wanna push the most amount of sales. Well, it's the same thing when you wanna push a belief. You stack your data and you launch it succinctly, like boom, 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 boom. So it creates this domino effect so that by the end of the week, everyone's believing that negative interest rates will save the planet. Here's where it all goes bad, is then essentially, um, okay, what was it? Oh, that's what it was. So the Fed, the same San Francisco Fed which here's the piece right here. Here's the original from February 4th. So six months later, negative interest rates and inflation expectations in Japan. Just read the introduction. After Japan introduced negative interest policy rate in 2016, market expectations for inflation over the medium term fell immediately. I'll skip through the rest. Japan's experiences also illustrates the desirability of taking preemptive steps to avoid zero interest rate bound. Essentially, what this says is that it didn't work. The whole thing didn't work. And so in six months, they completely changed their tune. So even though people are still kind of talking about this, there's there's no story to be made here. Even Mike Carney at the Jackson Hole speech said, past instances of very low rates have tended to coincide with high risk events, such as wars, financial crisis, and breaks in the monetary regime. So this is a typical case of flip-flop eddy is what I call it. All right, moving on. Bitcoin is failing as a safe haven. I know for all the Bitcoin maximalists, you're not going to like me for saying that. And I love Bitcoin too, but let's just be honest here uh, about a few things. Is that so far this year, which I don't think it should be proving itself, it's 10 years old, but so far this year, it's only performed well once in throughout this whole China-US trade war, throughout all the things going on right now and all the economic issues. It's only performed well one day. 
in, in one of these instances. And that was when the Chinese yuan rose above $7. And two days later, they had to repeg it to 6996 Through those two, three days, we saw a rally of Bitcoin. But there's been other key points when Bitcoin should have rallied if it is, is quote unquote, a safe haven. It did not. Okay, we have Argentina right now today issuing capital controls. The same Argentina that owes $56 billion to the IMF. Talk about embarrassing, right? So shouldn't Bitcoin be rallying, right? Venezuela, hyperinflation, you know, a lot of, you know, the Turkish lira we've had issues with this year. We, we've we seen it better perform against the Chinese Yuan. And it makes total sense because a ton of Chinese miners, a ton of Bitcoin mining happens in China. And because there's a lot of rich in China in comparison to like Argentina or Venezuela, okay, even though those people want crypto, it's insanely hard for them to get it. I know somebody who's involved in a project trying to get them paper wallets down there with $50 each with crypto just so that those people can have a, you know, inch of better life, better quality of life. So it's not even, it's not even close to being easy to get down to South America because it's also banned and they don't want it and they don't like it. Whereas in China, it's like you just, you know, it's easier than Coinbase. It's easier than Gemini. It's easier than every single exchange in America to get money on and off of the crypto exchanges. So that's why there's, there is a pegging going on for sure and a correlation going on between the Chinese Yuan and rises and falls of that and Bitcoin's performance, which at a minimum, you should on at least one of your charts, if you're trading Bitcoin, be looking at the denominator, which is US dollar and what the US dollar currency is doing and use that as a line chart on your you know, trading view chart as well so that you can see the correlation. But I would also suggest to add in the uh, Chinese Yuan as well. So Peter Schiff is a, obviously a big proponent uh, oh, opponent, excuse me, of um, of Bitcoin. It appears he absolutely hates it. He's been talking about how it's garbage um, since the beginning of time. But here's what's interesting: is that on July, uh, excuse me, in July 2010, which is when some of the first exchanges started coming online, if you would have put ten thousand dollars into Bitcoin and just sat on it, you would be worth one billion dollars today. One point nine. This is the number. 1.907, 148, 149. That's a billion dollars would be your worth. So again, for as great as he might be for trying to call gold for the last 10, 15 years to 10,000, and it's not even close, he's also he's also pushed you out of making a fucking billion dollars because you listened to that idiot. So I, I don't know. Like I love gold too, but I'm not willing to sit around and argue about which is better because I don't care. They're all valuable. I want to make money. I want to secure my financial future. I want to protect my fucking family, dude. Like, I don't care about being right. I want to be happy. I want to be safe. I just don't understand how that doesn't come into the conversation. I mean, bias is such an amazing thing. Cognitive dissonance is such an amazing thing that it'll literally get you to miss out on a billion dollars just to say you're right? <laughs> get your fucking head checked. I don't know. Anyway, and then, so the big thing I would talk about here is that at the end of the email is that, look, it's not time yet for Bitcoin to really try and prove itself. But as time goes on, I think it can be. I think there's a lot of big things that are going to occur. Most importantly, a ton more decimal places being added to the dollars and to the fiat currencies once we get into space. I think that once again provides a place for Bitcoin as a digital store of value. Is it there right now? No, it's just a speculative um, risk asset class. That's it. And so the next halving is pegged to be somewhere around May of 2020. And you see that we see some pretty astronomical gains one year after these halvings. And for the first time, we're, dro we're dropping from 3.8% to 1.9 inflation rate, which 1.9 inflation rate is lower than the Fed's target or mandate inflation rate for the United States dollar, which will be a first time ever. So if you want to talk about like stacking your deck for probably a bullish scenario, I can't think of a better I can't think of a better situation and setup than what you're seeing now. And so right now, Bitcoin, like everyone thinks it's the end of the world. It's ninety six hundred dollars right now. We've seen ninety three hundred. It might go down to eight thousand. It might touch it into the high sevens. That's when you buy. 
that's when you should be buying, especially if you plan on holding it longer term, like years to come. But okay, just look at this graphic for a second. It was a price multiple of 3.9x uh, after the second one year after the second halving, and 82x after the first halving. So that is 287% uh, or 8,000 percent here. So even if we came down and cut this number down again, and it was just a hundred percent gain, it's a hundred percent gain to hold on to something for a couple years. I do think that outweighs the performance of gold so far and other speculative assets. Absolutely. Okay, last day. I'm trying to keep this one shorter, so I'm speeding through this a little bit. We're at 15 minutes, so we're doing well. Uh, this was one of my favorite emails from the week, hidden black swan events. A black swan event is something small that you aren't really thinking is gonna make a big impact, and then, and then it does. So a uh, black swan event would be like the subprime mortgages themselves in the 2009 financial crisis and the role that played, okay? All right, so here is a short list of black swans that I see happening right now. The removal of the debt ceiling, pretty big deal. Um, we're at $17 trillion debt currently, and it's they can do whatever they want with that now. That could be a black swan. The Fed itself, quantitative easing um, was never meant to be permanent. Ben Bernanke uh, instituted that after the 2009 financial crisis. And we're about to start QE4. When you create money out of thin air, it destroys value, earnings, and purchasing power. So this combined with how they manipulate interest can create bubbles, absolutely. Hong Kong protests, goes without saying, but because they're they're so closely pinned to China, then it negatively impacts the performance of mainland China and the Chinese Yuan. So that is getting you know very spicy at this point. There's military intervention now going on. Um, bloodshed is starting to occur. There was a video that just surfaced yesterday of uh, whatever soldiers in riot gear, whatever they call them over there, uh, barging onto a subway and just beating people with billy clubs. It was brutal to watch. Um, Eurozone conflict, obviously they've got their issues. The UK is breaking away from Brexit. Boris is taking them out of the out of Europe completely, the Eurozone and uh, the EU. And they are going out on their own, it looks like. He's done some things with Parliament, shutting down Parliament to stop any chances of him getting stopped or the, the leaving Brexit getting railroaded. So that's pretty interesting. Germany's in rough shape. Argentina uh, currency collapse, which this has now happened. They just rolled out capital controls today. So I don't have more data on that yet, but $56 billion loan from the IMF. Uh, US dollar global reserve, talked about that already. Student loan debt, $1.56 trillion, 11.5% uh, of which is 90 days or more delinquent or in default. That creates stress in the household. That creates a lot of issues. Cortisol, I eat worse, I get fat, I don't exercise. More health problems, more health care, more health insurance. You know, more emergency visits, right? Like all that stacks up. It's such a small thing that turns into a big thing. Wealthy people stop spending. Talked about this last week. The 1% are not spending. They are saving. We have Barney's that um, that is going bankrupt. We have other, you know, Nordstrom's has been down. We have art being down for the first time in years, uh, for the first couple quarters this year. And cars and exotic things aren't selling as much. We have mansions uh, just filling up the MLS, okay? So there's a lot of stuff going on that is contributing to, you know, to that piece. And then the middle earners are all but holding that, holding up retail spending right now. So if something happens there, unemployment begins to rise, boom, that could be the trigger there. And then now I'll take a step back. We have, oh, we also have negative, um, we also have negative uh, bond rates and treasury rates on in every country except for the United States almost. So, now, just one of those things could be a black swan. We have like 20 things going on at once that could absolutely add to this. So uh, the other things I wanted to share with you is that the yield curve is now trending. It's in breakout in Google Trends. This just simply means that a breakout means that there's a shitload of people searching for it, in, essentially. So in DC, New York, Mass, Connecticut, North Dakota, breakout for these terms here. And then these ones, which I guess don't really even make sense, except gold is an investment topic. That's cool. That's cool to see. Breakout. So I'm sure Peter Schiff will love that one. He's probably already screenshotted that and tweeted about it. Uh, okay. So here you go. And then what else do I want to share? Okay. Yes, that's it. Today, uh, Trump put tariffs. He put 15% tariffs on another $112 billion. Here's why that matters. It's because now we're talking about electronics, clothing, 
uh, phones, computers, and household stuff, which JP Morgan estimates could cost the average household $1,000 this year. So now we're starting to get into other saucy stuff, okay? And this is gonna make it worse. And again, to the average person, they think that orange man bad. <laughs> but in actuality, if you've read the art of the deal, you know, and listen to that many times, this is his playbook, this is what he's doing. And I do think that he is the first guy to ever try to stand up to these other countries and say, yo, give me my money. Like you guys are robbing us, give me my money back. You know, give us our money back. And it's not going, you know, perfectly smooth because these things don't. And it's gonna definitely be a short-term pain for long-term pleasure, which again, most people just don't like. If they did, they'd be saving money. If they did, they would work their ass off now and live minimally and not buy Yeezys and not go out to eat five times a week so that later on in life they could have what they wanted. You know, so we know that's not true. So that applies, but already it's cost electronic companies 10 billion and it's gonna get worse starting today with this new 15%. Now, where this could get really nasty is if the US put 25% on everything and Shanghai put about 25% on everything in retaliation, which so far they've only put 75 billion on about 5,000 products so far. So we're not in awful territory, but if, if they both got up to 25% on everything, we would probably be in full-blown uh, recession, full-blown recession at that point. Okay, the last thing I wanna share with you is today, uh, up until 11 o'clock at night, you're getting 35% off on the Empire Intelligence Alerts membership. I've talked about this a lot. We really don't promote at all. This is the first time we're running a sale on our yearly membership. So if you wanna get in, hey, great, you're gonna save 166 bucks. If not, that's cool too, really doesn't matter. Um, if you wanna check out the sales page and all the information on what you get, the link will be underneath the video. Again, it's up to you. Most people don't know this, but we have a whole site, empireresearch.net, and we, we publish articles, like you see here. And I just got done publishing seven hidden recession indicators where I take some of the information that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks and a lot of information that we haven't been, and I put it all together. It's a little bit long of an article. I'm not gonna lie, like look at how long this is. It's a good 15 minute read. It's well worth it to get your head around, again, just like the black swan email is so important, to get your head around some of these recession indicators that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. And also too, it shows some support. So at least go over here and just smash this little recommend button and vote with, uh, with the emojis at the bottom. That would be pretty cool, right? Like whatever one you like, just go ahead and vote. And uh, if you want, share it on social media. I think this is a great piece. I think this really explains a lot of pieces that are going on right now that maybe the average person doesn't know. And it's our job to share that with them. It's our job to get this spread around so that more people understand the risks of what's going on right now. It's that simple. So if you wanna help with that, all you really gotta do is like share an article like this. Share one of our emails. I mean, we put out so much freaking content for free. It's insane, right? And that's it, that's all I got. If you like this video, click the like button. Even if you didn't like it, click the like button. Go ahead and comment below if you got something to say. If you're brand new to this channel, this channel is brand new. Show us some love, people. Go ahead and click the subscribe button, hit the bell notification. Be on the lookout, more videos dropping soon. Bye.